Hello everyone and welcome to One Civil Law and for today's latest decision in COVID restrictions land, we bring you to Governor Whitmer of the great state of Michigan who put in place re various restraining orders and proclamations and she just got she just got served by her own state Supreme Court who told her no not so much your COVID orders no you can't do this the law does not allow you to do this what are you thinking and the governor has so far indicated that they are not going to comply with this order from the state Supreme Court they say that they're going to try to ask for reconsideration Within, so that gives them like another three weeks or something. And then when the reconsideration is denied, they're going to find alternative measures to do exactly what they want to do. So apparently we've got a constitutional crisis brewing in the great state of Michigan because the governor is saying, I'm going to defy the, the lawful order of the state Supreme Court. But that's another story for another day, the constitutional crisis in Michigan and Whitmer. Let's discuss what the, the, the court actually said in this COVID-related order about the lockdown orders and whether or not they're constitutional in the case of Midwest Institute of Health versus Governor Whitmer. Let's get started with this. On March the 20th, the governor issued an order which prohibited medical providers from performing non-essential procedures, which, you know, Nice to tell doctors what is and is not essential. That's also a thing. Then three days later, she issued in another executive order, which ordered all residents to stay in their home. Lockdown, house arrest. On April the 1st, which is seven days later, she issued another executive order, which declared a state of emergency under the relevant law and a state of emergency and a state of disaster under a different law. She then requested the legislature extend the stay of the emergency by 70 days and a resolution was adopted by the legislature extending the state of the emergency, but only through the 30th of April. So there was an executive order, various executive orders that were issued says, don't perform non-essential medical procedures, whatever that is, stay in your home. And uh, also there's a state of emergency. And she said to the legislature, I'd like these orders to be extended for 70 days, please. And the, 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 the legislature said, uh, how about 30? And then the 30 days expired and she ignored it. So then on April the 30th, the day that the legislature had given her to, to th this is the limit of your power. So then on the 30th of April, she terminated the state of emergency. Huzzah, she has followed the law. But then immediately she issued another executive emergency, which provided for a state of emergency. Wait, what? No, the, the, the law doesn't allow you to do that. The, the, the legislature has said, you must terminate this on this date. And she's like, okay, I terminate it. And what do you know? I'm going to reissue it. Uh, yeah, no, 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 just now. The relevant law that makes this completely illegal for the governor to do this provides the following. So here's the law that, you know, the governor actually has to follow because, you know, it's law. Here is what it says. The governor shall, by executive order or proclamation, which is basically the same thing, declare a state of emergency if he or she finds that an emergency has occurred or that a threat of an emergency exists. The governor can issue an emergency order. The state of emergency shall continue until the governor finds that the threat or danger has passed, the emergency has been dealt with to the extent the emergency conditions no longer exist, or until the declared state of emergency has been in effect for 28 days. So the law says there is a limit. Yes, you can issue an executive order. You can issue an executive order for an emergency. But when you do that, you have to, there is a limit. Either the emergency ends or 28 days. What happens after 28 days? I'm so glad you asked because the statute specifically says this. After 28 days, the governor shall, which is to say, this is mandatory. This is not optional. The governor shall issue an executive order or proclamation declaring the state of emergency terminated unless by a request from the governor for an extension of the state of emergency for a specified number of days is approved by resolution of both houses of the legislature. So the law says, yes, you governor can issue an, an, an executive order on an emergency and you must terminate the executive order if the emergency stops being an emergency or 28 days runs. And if you want to go past 28 days, you have to ask us for permission. And then you can extend it as long as you want, as, as long as we say, okay. But you know, your power ends at this point. Governor Whitmer doesn't apparently see it that way for some reason.
Because the legislature here did not approve an extension beyond April the 30th, which is as much time as they gave you, the governor was required because, again, the statute says shall, they were required to issue an executive order de declaring this situation to be terminated. And while the governor did this, she acted immediately to issue another executive order for the exact same reasons as the other executive order. She terminated the executive order and then just turned right around and said, here's another executive order for the exact same reasons as the old executive order. The exact same reasons the legislature said wasn't enough. She could have gone back to the legislature and said, I need more time. But why, why, do, why do that? Why not just terminate it and then immediately reissue it under the exact same reasons the legislature said no? And then the court points out the obvious. If we allowed this, it would effectively render the 28-day limitation a nullity. Yeah. You know, if you could just, if you could just repeal an executive order and then reissue a new executive order for the exact same reasons, the 28 day limitation in the statute, which is in the statute, would be rendered a nullity. It's a different executive order, even though it's exactly the same, because I reissued it. And the, the state Supreme Court says, no, 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 you can't, you can't do that. If you want to extend your same executive order, you can do that. Ask the legislature, but you can't just reissue it because if you did, this section in the law would be meaningless. And yeah, no, you can't make something meaningless. That's not how wor law works. When the language is read in a reasonable conjunction with the language imposing the 28 day limitation, it is clear the governor possesses the authority or obligation to declare a state of emergency or state of disaster once and then must terminate the, the, the declaration if they've not authorized an extension. The governor does not possess an authority, much less obligation to redeclare the same state of emergency and thereby avoid this limitation under the authority. So yeah, you, you, have, you, have, you have exactly this much authority and no more. And if you could do this, it would go against the limitations on your authority. You can't just actually declare yourself to be king and say, I grant myself the authority. Yeah, no, 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 that's not, no. Further and contrary to the government's argument, the governor's argument, the 28 day limitation in the law does not permit, not does not amount to an impermissible legislative veto, which incidentally has been an issue in other states because other states write this differently and it can be a problem. So. We have covered this from a different state, and I can't remember which one because we've covered so many states at this point. It might be Pennsylvania. I'd have to double check. But we've covered it before where the statute says um, you have a, a, an indefinite period of time, but the, the state can, through a concurrent resolution, take away your authority. I'm pretty sure that was Pennsylvania that was written that way. So the way the Pennsylvania statute was written is you, the governor, have indefinite authority, but that it, that authority can be taken away by concurrent resolution. That was unconstitutional because you can't do that. The legislature can't act to infect law through a concurring resolution. That That's not going to fly. If you want to have the effect of law as the legislature, you actually have to, you know, pass a bill and it has to be signed into law. That is how the legislature does law. So if the statute says the governor has all the authority and you, the legislature, can, through a concurrent resolution, take away their authority, not without the governor's permission, you can't, because that's how law works, right? But this isn't written that way. This doesn't have that same defect. It's written the opposite way around. And for exactly that reason, it's, it's distinguishable. It says you only have this much authority in the first place. And if you want more, you have to come back to us. So that isn't a legislative veto. It isn't that the, it isn't the Congress saying or it isn't the legislature by their by their collective action saying we are going to take away your authority. It is by collective action saying we're not going to grant you more. And that is absolutely a distinguishment with a difference because the legislature can choose not to act. So if the statute says you only have 28 days of authority and if you want more, come back and then the legislature says no, that's okay because you can't force, force the legislature to act. So that is exactly why this was legal. This is constitutionally different from the one in Pennsylvania. And then the court goes on to say exactly this. The statute says that after 28 days, the governor shall issue an executive order unless the governor asks for a permission number of days that is approved by a resolution of both the houses of legislature which 
may or may not have to be signed by the governor, presumably does have to be signed by the governor. But since the governor is the one requesting it in the first place, the governor's probably going to sign it because the governor is the one asking for it. So, yeah, you, you may need the governor's signature, but you're probably there since the governor wants it. The governor's declaration of state of emergency may only last for 28 days absent the approval. So if the legislature does nothing, as here, your authority terminates by a law that has already existed. It already said you lack this authority. This isn't a legislative veto. No, this is the legislature refu refusing to give you more power, which is within their province. You can't just jack power. So take, so take notes. So take note, legislative drafters everywhere. This is the difference between the law that was written in Pennsylvania and the one that was written in Minnesota, and the one that was written in Michigan. The one that was written in Pennsylvania, not so much. The one here, yes. Please take notes, drafters. This is the way to do it. So that gets us to the procedural mechanisms in terms of the time periods and the differences there that are really, really important. But how about the scope of the subject matter, which is also a thing too. So can the governor issue an order that is this broad? Is that legal? So we've already covered the time thing. Let's cover the scope thing. Was the scope of it legal? Let's discuss that. Concerning the subject matter of the emergency powers granted by statute, it is remarkably broad, authorizing the governor to enter orders to protect life and property or bring the emergency situation within an affected area under control. It is indisputable that such orders to protect life and property encompass a substantial part of the entire police power of the state. And as a casual reminder, the term police power here should not be thought of as the kind of police that wear uniforms. When we say police power, we mean the power of the government to do stuff in general. All the power of the government to do stuff is police power. So the, 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 the court says here that these orders are a substantial part of all the power of government, which, you know, kind of is. To bring home the scope of these powers, let's discuss the specific things that were done here. How broad are these powers? Well, here's how broad the governor thinks they are. The governor has, by way of these orders issued under the law, effected the following policies. Requiring all residents to stay in home with limited exceptions. Requiring all residents to wear face coverings in indoor public spaces and when outdoors if unable to maintain a distance of six feet or more from individuals who are not a member of their household. Including requiring children to wear face coverings while playing sports. Requiring all residents to remain at least six feet away from people outside one's household to the extent feasible under the circumstances. Requiring all businesses to comply with numerous workplace safeguards, including daily health screenings of employees. Closing restaurants, food courts, cafes, coffee houses, bars, taverns, brew pubs, breweries, microbreweries, distilleries, wineries, tasting rooms, clubs, hookah bars, cigar bars, vaping lounges, barber shops, hair salons, nail salons, tanning salons, tattoo parlors, schools, churches, theaters, cinemas, libraries, museums, gymnasiums, fitness centers, public swimming pools, recreation centers, indoor sports facilities, indoor exercise facilities, exercise studios, spas, casinos, and racetracks, closing public places of amusement, including arcades, bingo halls, bowling alleys, indoor climbing facilities, skating rinks, and trampoline parks, Prohibiting non-essential travel, in-place or in-person work that is not necessary to sustain or protect life, which, you know, since getting paid helps with the sustaining life, what does that mean? And non-essential in-person business operations, prohibiting the sale of carpet, flooring, furnitures, plants, and paints, prohibiting advertisements for non-essential goods. Why, 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 why would we have to prohibit advertisements for non-essential goods? Why is that a bad thing? Even assuming there is such a thing as non-essential goods, why do we have to prohibit advertisements for it? I don't even begin to know. But well, that's not the only thing we're prohib prohibiting advertisements for. We're also prohibiting advertisements for non-essential medical and dental procedures and non-essential veterinary services. Don't even talk about it. Prohibiting visitors at healthcare facilities, resident care facilities, congregate care facilities, and juvenile justice facilities, no visiting your kid if they're in jail, and prohibiting boating, golfing, and public and private gatherings on persons and not in a single household. Well, you know, I'm just going to take a, a moment to express a personal opinion and say that sounds like a lot of things. What is more, these policies exhibit a sweeping scope 
you know, if that wasn't obvious, both with regards to subjects covered and powers exercised over those subjects. Indeed, they rest on assertion of power to reorder social life and to limit, if not altogether displace, the livelihood of residents across the states and throughout wide-ranging industries. Yeah, you know, these orders are somewhat um, notable in their scope. They, they do seem to assert a power to reorder all of social life to please my conception of how people should conduct their affairs and live their lives D does 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 seem a little bit expansive and 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 uh notable in its uh in its in totality of its impact so somewhat uh burdensome on people seems to be a reasonable conclusion yes the law in setting forth a necessary standard just as in setting forth a reasonable standard, neither supplies genuine guidance to the governor as how to exercise that authority, nor constrains her in her actions in any meaningful manner. It's, it's giving her a bit of uh, power to um, completely upend all of life based on what she deems to be reasonable. May, may, may lack some, some ideas of what exactly that means, may not be the most guiding document we've ever seen in the history of time. The consequence of such an illusory, which I always love that word, illusory, it's an illusion, right? It doesn't really exist. It's an illusion, like a magic trick. The consequence of this non-existent magic tricks-like standard is that the governor poses a free reign to exercise a substantial part of the state and local authority, including the police powers, indefinitely. There is, in other words, nothing with either the terms necessary or reasonable, yeah, that serves in any realistic way to transform this otherwise impermissible delegation of legislative power into a permissible delegation of executive power. Yeah, you know, the, the, only the legislature can legislate deep concepts, and exactly where that line is is a bit of a problem. But when the, when the, when the, when the law is whatever you deem necessary and reasonable, you can upend all of civilization on your whim indefinitely in all the domains we just talked about. You know, maybe that's a little bit more legislative in focus. Maybe the maybe it's a little bit unclear and, you know, maybe it's akin to legislative authority, which, you know, not so much if you're the executive. No, these facets of the law, its expansiveness, its indefinite duration and inadequate standards are simply insufficient. We accordingly conclude the delegation of powers to the governor to promulgate reasonable orders, rules, and regulations as he or she considers necessary to protect life and property, which is wholly subjective, right? What do we mean by reasonable? Well, fortunately, the law told you. What we mean by reasonable is not a reasonable man test. No, it's not objective. It's subjective. What we mean by reasonable is not what an ordinary common person might think of as reasonable. No, no, no. What we mean by reasonable is what she, in her own mind, subjectively, deems to be necessary. Therefore, this constitutes an unlawful delegation of legislative power and is therefore unconstitutional under our Constitution, which prohibits the exercise of legislative power by the executive branch. The powers conferred by the law simply cannot be considered constitutional by the standards reasonable or necessary, either separately or together. Yeah, no, you know, if if what is reasonable is what is necessary and what is necessary is what you deem necessary subjectively in your own head at any given time, um, that seems a little bit much. We conclude the governor lacked authority to declare a state of emergency or state of disaster under the law after April 30th on the basis of the pandemic because no, you can't do that because the legislature specifically said you have to come back and ask for an extension, and the legislature said no, so your authority disappeared. Further, we conclude under the law that it is a violation of our constitution, of our state, because it purports to delegate to the executive branch a legislative power, including a plenary police power, and to exercise these powers indefinitely. No. As a consequence, the law cannot continue to provide a basis for emergency powers. Thus, that brings us to the end of the current discussion of the state of Governor Whitmer's orders in the great state of Michigan and her authority. And the state Supreme Court says 
no, under the one statute, you get this much time and you have to ask for more. And the state legislature said no. And under this other provision, it purports to allow you based on what you think in your own subjective head as what you think is necessary to basically upend all of the order. And by the way, here's an extremely long list of all the ways that you've done that. And no, you know, that's not really going to fly. So you can't issue this. And as I mentioned, the governor, Whitmer, has indicated they are not they are not inclined to follow this this order. They have they are going to ask for a reconsideration, which buys them like three more weeks. And then of course the state supreme court is going to say no because they said no the first time, but she gets three more weeks to issue her orders. And then when the when they state when the supreme court of Michigan says no for the second time in three weeks, then she's going to I don't know out of nowhere somehow create new authority for herself to make it legal. So if she can find some other statute or some other mechanism that is lawful to do this, then okay. But the state Supreme Court seems to have somewhat covered its bases. So I'm not exactly sure what the governor has in mind other than open defiance to the state Supreme Court. And then the state of Michigan has a constitutional crisis because the governor is refusing to abide by the interpretation of the law of the branch that interprets the law. So constitutional crisis coming to the great state of Michigan in the near future. But until that happens, this is all. Until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. If you liked this latest video, please give it a like below and hit the join button. For 99 cents a month, you too can give a recurring membership that helps this channel grow and helps YouTube to recommend this channel to others. We really appreciate your continued financial support and all your love. And until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.